Tinder is a rapidly growing social network for meeting people and dating. In the past few years, Tinder's user base has grown rapidly, and the engineering team has scaled to meet the demands of increased popularity. On Tinder, you are presented with a queue of suggested people that you might match with, and you swipe left or right to indicate that you like or dislike them. Creating that queue of suggestions is a complex engineering problem. Many factors go into suggestions that Tinder gives you. Geo-targeting, food preferences, your favorite band, your photos, and the people that you have swiped on in the past. Brian Lee is an engineering manager at Tinder, and he joins the show to describe the interaction between the mobile client, the back-end servers, and the offline analytics and machine learning. We also talk about managing different teams and how to reorganize smoothly as a company grows. If you like this episode, we've done many other shows about scaling companies like Uber, New Relic, and Giphy. You can download the Software Engineering Daily mobile app to find all of our old episodes and easily discover new topics that might interest you. If you don't like this episode, you can easily find something more interesting by looking at the recommendation engine in the app as well. And these mobile apps are all open sourced at github.com slash software engineering daily. If you're looking for an open source project to hack on, we would love to get your help. The Software Engineering Daily open source community is building a new way to consume software engineering content. And the different projects in github.com slash software engineering daily are wide ranging. We've got an Android app, an iOS app, a recommendation system, a web front end platform. And again, if you're interested in contributing, go to softwareengineeringdaily.com and go to the Slack channel or go to github.com slash softwareengineeringdaily or send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com. So let's get on with this episode and I hope you enjoy it. You have a software project that you want to build. Everybody does. I love building products, but I know more about how software fits together than how to actually write the code itself. I don't spend a lot of time writing code, but I do like to build software. That's why I use TopTal. TopTal is the best place to find reasonably priced, extremely talented software engineers to build your projects from scratch. You can get a pair of Apple AirPods when you use toptal.com slash se daily to work with an engineer for at least 20 hours. And I recommend it. I think it's a great way to build your projects if you don't have time to build them yourself. There's a misconception that engineers have to build all of their own projects just because they're capable of doing that. It's not true. TopTal has only the top 3% of developers. They turn away 97% of the developers that apply to work on the TopTal platform, and that's how you get a matching process that's unlike anything else I've seen in the freelancer marketplace. And I've tried a lot of different freelancing platforms. TopTal has such high-quality engineers, and they listen through the design specifications that you have. They handpick the perfect developer for your project. And this has saved me countless hours in my development process. There's really nothing that compares to TopTal that I have seen. So you can get a free pair of Apple AirPods when you try TopTal at toptal.com slash se daily. Find an engineer that's going to help you build your side project and get your MVP off the ground. As long as you do at least 20 hours, you get those free Apple AirPods. And if you've already got a company that you're working on, you can also use TopTal to scale your team and get everything done faster and raise the bar for your engineering or get through that blocker that's preventing your company from getting to the next level. So check out toptal.com slash se daily and find an engineer who will help your project succeed. Brian Lee is a director of engineering at Tinder. Brian, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Today, we're going to talk about a variety of things. You are in the engineering management side of things of Tinder. We talked to Alex, who is a engineering growth manager for the growth team of Tinder. And 
from you, I want to get a different side of things. I want to talk about more the infrastructure and the development process and the mobile app development process, how that all works. I guess before we get started, we should give an overview for the listeners for what Tinder is in case they're not familiar with it. Describe the Tinder app from your point of view. Okay, sure. Tinder is a location-based mobile applications that basically let users who are mutually interested in, in, in each other to match and uh, start a conversation. So we also pioneer the swiping experience where you go on the app, you download a list of recommended users you can start swiping with, right? Swiping left uh, means you're passing on the person. Swiping right means you are interested in matching with the person. And swiping up is the super like and, and indicates a strong interest in matching with the person. Most of our users use Tinder as a dating app, but I've uh, come across users that are just interested in meeting new people when they move to a uh, new location. And as well as I have actually come across people that are on Tinder looking for a job. I've matched with two people that were wow. specifically uh, looking for a job, and which I actually had a pretty lengthy chat with them about how that was going. So that was a really interesting conversation. What kind of job were they looking for? If you don't oh, they were ask. definitely they were definitely looking for uh, to get into the tech job. I'm not go- getting too much into details, but I remember one of them were just uh, fresh graduated from had an MBA degree and was looking to get into engineering management position. And in their profile, they actually specifically said that he wasn't you know uh, she wasn't looking for a date and she was actually looking for a job. So hmm. okay, well, I think this illustrates Tinder was is a type of application where the core breakthrough of the app is so interesting that there's a million different ways that the company can grow a million different directions it can grow it can grow horizontally and get into new markets it can grow vertically and focus on improving its own product offering and it's doing both of those types of growth and th- i think the core offering that Tinder made a breakthrough on was gamifying the relationship introduction experience and turning it into a fun way to meet people with the double opt-in where both people express their interest before either of them feels spammed or affronted. And so the interface is extremely simple, but that simplicity comes from a, a set of insights brilliant product insights that I think you you kind of have to mess around with the app to really understand why it's it's so cool and it's so useful and it has so much potential for growth that is being capitalized on. And, you know, we talked about some of that in the growth episode, which will air before this, so people can check that out if they're interested. You're director of engineering, so what are the teams that are under you? Yeah, sure. I have uh, multiple teams that are under me. First and foremost, it's it's the mobile engineering team. It's divided up by uh, features or components. We have the discovery and profile mobile team, which is responsible for maintaining the recommendation view where you can swipe on users. And the profile view, where you can actually go in and, and get the details of the users, uh, as well as a post-matching team that is responsible for maintaining the match list, as well as the, you know, the, the, the chatting experience. I also manage the uh, web team. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, Tinder actually has a a web product. We're only testing in a few countries right now, and eight uh, testing countries. We have uh, a a team of about eight uh, web engineers uh, right now working on a web product. And I also manage the te- uh, revenue team. The revenue team is basically responsible for you know making money, keeping the lights on for Tinder, so we can work on new and cooler features. Hmm. Let's start with the matching discussion. The matching list that pairs people together to potentially meet up is as foundational to Tinder's current product as the newsfeed of. Facebook, you know, it's, this is the core thing that you're engaging with when you open up the app, if you're an average user. And I imagine there is a lot of engineering depth that has gone into the matching system. I'm not sure to what depth you can go into it, but you know, one thing I'm just curious about is like, what's the contract between the front end and the back end for, for getting matches as, as, as a way to start, a way to start off? 
Yeah, sure. I guess the really most important thing is is not the matching itself, but really just showing the recommendations of users that you potentially could match with. That's that's the starting point where you would get a list of people that you know Tinder thinks that you would be interested in matching with. Um, oh, oh, by the way, that's also uh, confined by a, a radius uh, by location. It's people around you that you can actually match with. And as you're swiping through uh, the users, swiping right basically indicates an interest, right? So you also mentioned uh, about double opt-in. And once the user uh, is being swiped right on and it gets sent back to our server, and that user will then service on the other list uh, of that user. And if the other user also swipe right on you, then there is a match. And how it so so that's a the process of of creating potential matches uh, mm-hmm. or I guess so this is recommendations is the term you used when you log in to Tinder for the first time I think you need to authenticate with Facebook it's built on top of Facebook right so you use Facebook your Facebook data that's like the seed for your pairings correct we also now uh, offer SMS auth as well as Facebook authentication. Okay. Well, so let's say I log in with Facebook. So the first time I log in, Tinder sucks in all my interests and my likes and my some of my interactions that are public to Tinder and uses those as a way to formulate people who might share the recommendations and the, sorry, share share the likes, share the interests, share the habits. Uh, of me in order to find a, an accurate match. Is that, is that correct? Is that what happens? That's part of it. I, there's a few other uh, you know, strong indications on uh, potential interests, such as school or job, but they, they all go into considerations. But uh, uh, the Facebook, we actually don't really feed the Facebook uh, friend list into uh, you know, our uh, match criteria. More is the interest that, that, that we suck in from Facebook. We also use that as a signal to potentially match you with other people that you might be interested in. Hmm. How strong of a signal do you get from that, from that data? Well, so obviously that's better than no signal, right? But, uh, a, a, you know, just having a interest is sometimes is not really enough for you to really uh, have a deep connection, but it, it, it definitely helps as a conversation starter, you know, just knowing both of the users uh, that like uh, Golden State Warriors, potentially that could spark a conversation. So this is a very complex problem. I took an algorithms class in uh, in, in college, and the I, I'm sure this is not exactly the same problem, but the the problem of stable matching. I think if you take to two sides where you're trying to find a, a matching that kind of can optimize for different utility functions, you've got, for example, I think the classic example is you've got a you've got a set of nursing residents that are uh, you know they're somewhere in nursing school or medical school and you're trying to pair them with medical schools that they might want to go do their residency in uh, this was like the classic problem and there was the question of how do you algorithmically match to maximize the the optimal matching between those two sides is is this is this problem analogous to it because when if I log in for the first time, there's a huge pool of people that are geographically close to me, and there's all these different factors that you could optimize on. You could optimize on location. You could optimize on the shared interests. How hard of a problem is that? Oh, it's a, it's a, a definitely an extremely hard problem, especially when you first log in and don't have a lot of signals because human beings are extremely complex, and uh, just knowing what their interests are never enough. Just, you know, kind of think about the relationship that you see around you that sometimes it could, you know, that you see a couple that potentially don't have uh, a a whole lot in common. Right. So and but then you also see couples that have a lot in common. So while that's definitely relevant, but it doesn't necessarily kind of guarantee that it's going to be a a match that could that could be made. The uh, stronger signal is actually more com- uh, coming from after you've been using Tinder a little bit and we know the patterns of your, of your swiping uh, preferences. That's a much uh, a stronger and uh, accurate uh, indicator of the types of uh, people that you're interested in, in matching with. Hmm. And, but most of the swiping is based just on physical appearance, right? 
that's definitely a part of it but uh, some a lot of users also click into the profile and look at, at the profile and you know school and uh, you know and, and a summary and that also you know that's also a big part of the consideration uh, we do see that people with school and job filled out with a much higher success rate than people without DigitalOcean Spaces gives you simple object storage with a beautiful user interface. You need an easy way to host objects like images and videos. Your users need to upload objects like PDFs and music files. DigitalOcean built Spaces because every application uses object storage. Spaces simplifies object storage with automatic scalability, reliability, and low cost. But the user interface takes it over the top. I've built a lot of web applications, and I always use some kind of object storage. The other object storage dashboards that I've used are confusing, they're painful, and they feel like they were built 10 years ago. DigitalOcean Spaces is modern object storage with a modern UI that you will love to use. It's like the UI for Dropbox, but with the pricing of a raw object storage. I almost want to use it like a consumer product. To try DigitalOcean Spaces, go to do.co slash sedaily and get two months of Spaces plus a $10 credit to use on any other DigitalOcean products. You get this credit even if you have been with DigitalOcean for a while. You can spend it on Spaces or you can spend it on anything else in DigitalOcean. And it's a nice added bonus just for trying out Spaces. The pricing is simple. $5 per month, which includes 250 gigabytes of storage, and one terabyte of outbound bandwidth. There are no costs per request, and additional storage is priced at the lowest rate available, just a cent per gigabyte transferred and two cents per gigabyte stored. There won't be any surprises on your bill. DigitalOcean simplifies the cloud. They look for every opportunity to remove friction from a developer's experience. I'm already using DigitalOcean Spaces to host music and video files for a product that I'm building, And I love it. I think you will too. Check it out at do.co slash sedaily and get that free $10 credit in addition to two months of spaces for free. That's do.co slash sedaily. So what can, how, how tight is that feedback loop? If I if I open up the app and I swipe through 15 people, am I going to get an updated set of recommendations based off of those left and rights? By the way, for people who don't know, left a left swipe is you don't want you don't have an interest in the person. A right swipe is you are interested in the person. So if I give it 15 pieces of signal, is it going to give me some some new machine learning based off of that or is the is the machine learning more of an offline batch process uh currently it's more more uh, of offline process we we kind of we process it at, at an interval i believe that interval is like twice a day right now so you know your swiping of uh 50 people won't go into the next batch of recommendations right away although we are you know trying to get as closer to real time as possible can you talk more about how you batch that? Because if I do, you know, I could imagine different models. If I'm going to do 15 swipes in a session, maybe you want to keep all those on the phone and then send them at one hour intervals, send the batches of my swipes back to the server, or you could do it streaming uh, one by one. Uh, and then, you know, once it hits the server, there's different ways that you could aggregate those. You know, if you've got if you've got millions of users that are, having these batches of swipes come into the system and you need to process them all. Give me an overview of that pipeline if if you're familiar with it. Yeah, sure. So the batching of uh, swiping definitely get to the server uh, in real time because we also need to process your uh, likes and dislikes right away so that um, I'm sure if you've used the app before, when you swipe right right on someone and then you get the uh, it's a match screen, right? It's, um, It's definitely a sort of a, a very uh, gratifying moment when you get that it's a match uh-huh. screen, right? So uh, that obviously has to go into real time because we need to tell you that whether that uh, created a match or not. 
the actual kind of processing afterwards uh, it happened more in a uh, uh, offline batch processing uh, where you know we basically just load all, all users preferences and and then kind of run it through our, our, um, our model and basically to we have uh, certain scores for users that we can then use it to uh, match with other users so all my swipes those are going into a production data store somewhere because it's important for real-time interaction and then at some point it gets loaded in it gets copied and loaded into some offline analytics system that it's that is going to process those swipes and turn them into better recommendations what can you tell me about the analytics pipeline Okay, well, so there's uh, two things there I want to touch on. One is the production data actually, so to do the recommendation, actually, that doesn't really flow, the data doesn't really flow into the analytics uh, database. It just kind of gets uh, processed uh, separately, but it kind of still remain in the production realm. The analytics database is more for like business analytics, you know, for us to kind of, for uh, business and, and product managers and executives kind of look at um, how the users are interacting with our app and try to get a better understanding of how they use it and, and you know, what features that we should develop on. It's actually uh, not a real-time uh, pipeline from the production database and into the anal- analytics database. So there's multiple reasons that we don't have a direct mapping from uh, the production database to, to the analytics database. Uh, one is permissions. We have an ops team that kind of run uh, the uh, production uh, database, which, you know, for Tinder, there's a lot of PII information that's available in the production database. So there's a lot of cleansing that you have to do before you would load that data into the analytics database. So instead of actually batch uh, batch exporting that data from the production database to the analytics database, we actually have a separate pipeline. I'll give you an example. When a like or a dislike that comes into our uh, backend, we would store that like in our database, and we also fork that like into a separate data pipeline, which will eventually flow the data into our uh, analytics database. Mm. Mm. So the separate pipeline, so that's going to uh, copy the data into analytics databases. I imagine it also pipes it into these machine learning processes where you kind of only need you you just need the the like data for some ephemeral period of time and then you can garbage collect it after you use it to create better machine learning recommendations is that accurate Yes, and uh, likes and dislikes is just kind of one dimensions of it. We also look at the images of a user's profile because there's actually a lot of information you can extract from the images. Uh, we also do image processing to extract keywords from the images to kind of see what the interests are because you can actually tell a lot about a person by looking in, in the, at the profile pictures and hmm. for example people who take pictures as outdoor and or pictures uh, people with uh, pictures with uh, an animal like a dog right so we can basically extract uh, oh. dog, dog lovers for example or uh, outdoorsy person from you know from pictures well that's interesting so when i log in with facebook are you going through the pictures also to know more about what the person does uh, no, we, we actually don't. So we only kind of go through the pictures that the users upload. Th- there is a pipeline for for the user to actually pick and choose which Facebook user, uh, which Facebook photos they want to import into Tinder. But we don't just import their photos from Facebook without their permissions. I, yeah, I like that approach. It's a, like, less aggressive. I think Tinder's in a place where like pretty comfortable. You probably don't want to do anything that's going to like scare the people. Uh, so... Okay, well, so talk a little bit more about the. I'm just very interested in the in the in the pipeline where you're copying. So the data gets copied. The data gets stored in analytics, which I think is Redshift, right? And then the Redshift database can be used by business intelligence people. And then the growth team, you know, in that show when I talked to Alex, he was talking all about Redshift. And then offline, it's or sorry, then it's copied into this this uh, other pipeline. Can you talk about some of the infrastructure choices of that pipeline? Are you like queuing all these things up in Kafka and then processing them off of that or Kinesis or what are you doing there? So we have a separate data engineering team that's uh, solely responsible for, you know, doing the data pipeline. Their uh, choice of the current choice is uh, Kafka. They're using Kafka to pipe the data, uh, the data in. We also do use uh, Kinesis in some cases, but the main thing that we use right now is Kafka. Mm hmm. 
Okay. So we dove pretty deep into this one dimension of the recommendations, and we, we kind of sped forward. I want to zoom back out to mobile and the user experience. Well, not the user experience, but the the contract between the front end and the back end. Because I, So I worked briefly at Amazon for about eight months, and I worked on this one very small system for just, a, it was a back end calculation system for taxes. And you know what you learn at these big companies is just that when a com- when a company gets to a certain size it's really hard to manage the different services and the interdependencies and one place where there is an important interdependency is the front end and the back end the interaction between the mobile and the back end side of things do you have a general contract or a way of doing things for how the front end collaborates with the back end um, yeah, sure. So we mostly the front and the back end kind of communicate between each other uh, just through uh, RESTful services. We also have push notifications from the back end to the front end in the form of either uh, in-app push notifications or just, a, you know, just a mobile push notifications. For the uh, RESTful services, we do have schemas predefined for you know, for uh, API services that, that we use. Uh, for example, if you were to send a like from the client side to the back end, then you send it through a, um, a like API uh, with the predefined post schema that we have. So what are some of the big problems in modern development where you have an iPhone and Android application that's separate and you have to create a unified experience across the two? What kind of problems does that create for you? We are actually pretty lucky in that front because, you know, the swiping is, it was a very tender thing uh, to begin with. So we just started out with a very, you know, tender specific experience, right? So we kind of carried that experience on. If you actually look at our iPhone and Android phone, uh, and iPhone app and the Android app right now, you probably won't notice a lot of difference between the UIs, uh, between the two. You can actually see the, we have, the swiping experience we also have below the swiping there's the gamepad where you have the buttons where you can click on which is likes or pass or super like those are very like tinder specific right we do want to kind of respect the os choices of ui elements and you know some of that is like the share the sharing carrots and things like that we we do try to like the small elements we do try to abide by the guidelines provided by the you know uh, ios and android one of the teams that you oversee is the revenue team. What is the revenue team responsible for? In short, the revenue team is responsible for making money, right? So uh, monetizing uh, the applications so that we can pay the bills. Okay. And so how does that translate to engineering decisions? So we have three kind of major revenue streams that we have right now. One is a subscription model, so where you can subscribe to Tinder on a Play Store or App Store, where you get uh, Tinder Plus, which is a kind of premium uh, features that you can, uh, for one, you can have unlimited likes. You could have uh, a boost, which is a feature that lets you kind of jump in front of the line for a set amount of time. And it will also let you kind of passport into different locations so you can match with people in different locations. So that that is our uh, one of our major revenue stream. Second one is uh, more of an a la carte purchasing. Uh, you can just purchase a super like or you can purchase a, a boost on its own and, and use that. The third revenue stream is uh, ads. So, you know, um, upon certain number of swipes, we serve you one ad. Um, and those are the three ways of, uh, of, of you know, Tinder making money. Mm. One of the things I discussed with Alex is a comparison between Tinder and LinkedIn because LinkedIn is a company that also has some significant varietal revenue streams. It has uh, an ads business, it has a business for recruiters, and it has a business for users that get a premium service. And I think these account for like, you know, 20% and 60% and then tw- another 20% of their revenue. So the revenue is like heavily split, which is very different than a Google or a Facebook where all of their money is in ads and it becomes easier for them to focus on business decisions because the revenue stream is a little bit more uh, focused unless they're talking about other bets in the future and they're talking about revenue streams in the different revenue streams in the future. Does that 
cause any interesting decisions where you have to make trade-offs between different revenue streams? Certainly, because you know, out of the three streams, uh, obviously we're not pulling the same amount of revenue in those streams. So some are more important than the others. For example, for example, like we don't serve many ads, so ads is you know like right now is not as important as the revenue stream uh, for us. Uh, so we definitely prioritize you know the subscription model a little bit over the ads model. You know, as as far as also because having ads is also a disruptive. It could it could potentially be a disruptive experience for users. Did you do a lot of measurement around that, or, or are you doing a lot of measurement as to what's the cost benefit? analysis of displaying one additional ad? Yeah, certainly. We, we do a lot of testing around how many ads we can actually display before it's too many. So we closely monitor the swiping uh, rate as, as well as the retention rate just to see how a user is reacting to seeing different number of ads in a, a set period of time. Hmm. Any interesting results from that? And so we have found that um, it's actually uh, users actually not uh, they they you know although they complain on the app store about uh, not wanting to see ad but largely we haven't really seen that much of a difference between serving them uh, twenty to thirty ads. Well, you swipe through so many people that you that you don't like them to match with. It's probably not a big deal to, to swipe past one additional ad, right? Well, so originally we were thinking that, you know, just having too many ads, a user actually might not like that. But uh, like through our testing, actually, we didn't find a lot of difference between people that get to an ad in 20 swipes or 30 swipes. Hmm. The Tinder user base has scaled a lot in the last few years. And Tinder is a, is a dominant force in the dating technology space. I think it was acquired by IAC, which is a a kind of a conglomerate of different dating apps and uh, and news services. That's right. It was acquired by IAC, right? Or it was founded from IAC. It was founded within IAC. Yeah. Right. Okay. Cool. So as it has scaled, what were the aspects of the tech stack that had to be refactored or were breaking under the pressure of the increased user base? Our user base has has kind of ballooned uh, over the years. So we started uh, actually building our backend stack off of uh, AWS. So fortunately, AWS actually handled a lot of that scaling for us. So we didn't have to worry too much about scaling the servers or anything like that. But there are still, you know, breakages within that stack. Um, you know, one of the examples we had, I was saying this is probably like a year ago, we had an outage because one of our uh, cluster of uh, caching servers were not enough to handle the load that we were getting at the time. So, and, and that was actually a central point of failure to the services at that point. So realizing that, uh, what we had to do is, uh, uh, one, to in the short term, just to scale out that cluster to be able to handle the traffic that was coming in. And we also try to, you know, look at the design of our overall services architecture just to try to avoid, you know, these uh, central points of failure so that, you know, having one cluster down will not actually break the entire cluster of uh, Tinder uh, backend services. How is that growth of the user base translated to growth in the company? And has it changed the org structure of the company? Definitely. The org structure is, you know, it's definitely reflective of business needs, right? The, the more users we have, uh, you know, we definitely need the infrastructure to keep up with the, with the user base. And uh, we also have to hire uh, more mobile engineers to build out features to kind of keep up on the feature demand from the users. So we started off on, on the mobile side of things. I think it was four mobile engineers, four or five Android engineers just about a year and a half ago and uh, about the same amount of iOS engineers. They were basically just kind of one big team, right? Like one one mobile team that was kind of handling all the features that were coming in. But uh, as we were getting more feature requests, as we were trying to keep up with that demand, we had to kind of uh, spin, spin off like sef- several teams to handle more features. So we started to go more towards a, a feature or component-based teams where a feature team would now have 
to potentially two iOS uh, engineers or two Android engineers and one backend engineers. And then that would actually, you know, uh, go and maintain one feature, uh, for example, the, the recommendation uh, cards. But as the team grew, other problems actually uh, surfaced. Like, for example, once the team, uh, once we have multiple uh, feature teams, we started get, getting like very fragmented development on architectural decisions that were made uh, along the line, even it just in the iOS or Android app itself. So uh, what's an example of that, the, the fragmentation? For, for example, you have like three different teams that are working on, uh, one team could be working on the, the pre-matching experience, one team could be matching, uh, working on the post-matching experience, and they, you know, because they are more focused on deli- uh, delivering their features, right? So they, they would kind of try to pick and choose uh, architecture that would kind of work more towards kind of their development goals. And mm-hmm. uh, even the architecture might start to diverge a little bit, right? Because they have different timelines, potentially they're working with different skill levels with the iOS engineers and Android engineers, right? So, you know, you, you kind of start to see the code base being fragmented at that point. Uh, and that's when we started realizing that we also need a central kind of platform team to kind of hold, um, oh. kind of glue these teams together and make sure we introduce like, uh, uh, you know, uh, certain architectural guidelines and certain ways of doing things, right? Like, you know, one team was using uh, MVP as, as, as their, uh, you know, kind of overall architectural gu- guidance and another, another team started adopting a clean architecture, right? But because these teams are kind of independent uh, and, and so we would have to have one overarching uh, platform team that can actually make certain architectural decisions or kind of build a common infrastructure layer so that, you know, everybody's kind of, uh, uh, every uh, feature team is more on a similar uh, architecture so that they can, uh, you know, have a common um, a common infrastructure to build upon. I'm not familiar with those two architectural patterns that you described. Can you describe them a little more and explain why they conflict with each other? Oh, they don't necessarily conflict with each other. So MVP is uh, oh MVP oh MVP yeah minimum so viable M- product. No 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 it, it's 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 a it's a it's a model view presenter. Oh yeah, so it's it basically one of the you know fairly popular architectural decisions that you make you know, when you choose when you actually start building an app and and actually works really well when the application is actually uh, fairly small and, and the team size is fairly small but you know as soon as you scale out to a bigger team and that architecture it just won't really be able to uh, scale as uh, the, you know the features that you're coming in so you know other architectures might have to we might actually have to uh, adopt other architectures to be able to help that so some other teams started uh, you know adopting a clean architecture they don't necessarily they don't necessarily conflict with each other but you start you end up having two different approaches, right? So when a team member potentially could switch from one team to the next, right? Or uh, sometimes you have to co-review each other's code. And then, you know, when you have different approaches, sometimes it's just, you know, there's more context switching and you have to adapt to other teams sort of uh, uh, co-style, right? So um, there's, you know, you just, you just kind of start to see things diverge when, when, when you don't have an overarching uh, platform team to kind of, you know, hold everybody together. Explain what the platform team did. Or oh, okay, so you decided you need a needed a platform team. Did you gather that from disparate teams, or did you have to hire for it? And then what did they do once they got assembled? So it, we we just started, you know, kind of having first thing that we did was that we just uh, having individual engineers from that platform, like iOS, Android, uh, backend. They would first they would meet regularly, right? That would that start as the base of the platform team. No one was like specifically assigned to the platform team because we were still trying to scale out the team size. We were just going to distribute the, the platform items amongst the feature team members. Like, for example, let's say that you have to write um, API service layer and that, that actually would be shared across different feature teams, right? Who is going to write that, right? So when we didn't have a, a specific platform team, that just kind of got distri- distributed amongst uh, uh, all the feature teams. But then we realized that that's actually something that we needed a central team to do so they can actually be reused by several teams. So we started just hiring more people and have designated people that joined the platform team. And we started out with one person and then quickly scale out to about three people right now. Mm. What was their approach to, to doing the refactoring? When you had a de- once you had a dedicated person to... to- kind of do the platform engineering full-time, what did they start to do? 
the first thing that they did was kind of just kind of trying to analyze what are some of the, you know, what are the hardest problems? Uh, what are the most uh, most common pain points, right? So, uh, for, for example, people were using different, people were even using different uh, image libraries to actually load uh, images, right? So we actually were using, I think, I believe we were using up to three different image loading libraries um, because they were, they had different advantages, uh, you know, to their own. Some might be actually better in, in doing uh, uh, GIFs. Some might be better off, you know, just doing a, a JPEG download so you know the f- first thing the the platform team comes in and actually kind of just kind of just see a common pattern of what are some of the common uh, you know common things that different teams are trying to use and kind of extract the commonality out and then uh, you know kind of start uh, writing a, a, a library and then and then you know uh, once the, that library is written and then it gets distributed to different feature teams and so they can stop uh, they can start uh, adopting that what's the release process for tinder so right now uh, the release process we, we trying to we trying to adopt a train model so uh, we have a two week release process so every two weeks uh, we, we are trying to release a, a new product or new release every two weeks it starts with you know being feature complete right I mean it starts with planning where let's say that if we want to have uh, release a feature uh, somewhere down the line I would first do a planning on how many weeks of development that is going to take. And uh, from there, you figure out, you know, what release that might fit into. Since we have a two-week release uh, train, then you can sort of predict that your feature is going to land in that particular release, right? And then you kind of work backwards into, here's when I actually have to get the build to uh, QA, and uh, here's when I actually have to, you know, start doing the translation, right? So we do uh, have a... uh, pre-release checklist that each team has to go through. Some of the items such as, you know, you, you would need to get the analytics events in, you know, uh, by a certain time. And you would also have to get the translation in uh, about a week before the release. And uh, as you get closer to the release, we have to start the, uh, the testing processes, uh, the testing uh, process. And the first thing that we do is we have an internal dog food, uh, dog food process where we do, Tinder has about 250 employees, right? That's uh, about 200, you know, 200 some testers that we can utilize with, you know, different models and uh, models of phones and different iOS. Uh, OSs. So we about uh, a week before the release, we would cut a, a final bill and we would uh, distribute it across the company so that people can start testing the pre pre release build and they would you know keep filing uh, bugs uh, as they find those bugs and we would have about a week to kind of fix all those bugs uh, before the final release. There's a, a, you know, when we have a, a few feature teams, one of the challenges we, we, uh, we ran into was how do you then kind of, you know, make sure that if, if a team doesn't make a, a, a cutoff of a release date, like how do you actually, you know, schedule that in or how do you turn features on and off so that you can like put that into a modular release, right? So, uh, you know, we had to introduce like feature flagging. So we have a, a pretty uh, complex feature flagging system where you can say, um, I can roll this feature out to a certain percent of the users. And if we detect problems after the release, then we can actually roll that back. The octopus a sea creature known for its intelligence and flexibility. Octopus Deploy, a friendly deployment automation tool for deploying applications like .NET apps, Java apps, and more. Ask any developer, and they'll tell you that it's never fun pushing code at 5 p.m. on a Friday and then crossing your fingers hoping for the best. We've all been there. We've all done that. And that's where Octopus Deploy comes into the picture. Octopus Deploy is a friendly deployment automation tool, taking over where your build or CI server ends. Use Octopus to promote releases on-prem or to the cloud. Octopus integrates with your existing build pipeline, TFS and VSTS, Bamboo, TeamCity, and Jenkins. It integrates with AWS, Azure, and on-prem environments. You can reliably and repeatedly deploy your .NET and Java apps and more. If you can package it, Octopus can deploy it. It's quick and easy to install, and you can just go to octopus.com to trial Octopus free for 45 days. That's octopus.com. 
o c t o p u s dot com. Yes, and I think I talked to Alex about the difficulty of testing for UI bugs with unit and integration tests and in an app like Tinder where the core offering of the product is fairly simple. It seems like a lot of the errors that can arise would be UI errors or perhaps something that lags a little bit and it's a little non-deterministic. To what degree can you do unit testing and integration testing and, and to what degree do you rely on that process of releasing the app to the 250 employees at Tinder and having them dog food it? So unit testing is a very important part of the development process. It's there not just to enforce the quality of kind of the final product, but it also kind of really make the developers think um, how to make their code testable and modular, you know, before it even gets uh, you know, to the hands of uh, the dog food, uh, dog food the, the company dog food. We don't actually mandate a uh, percentage of code coverage for uh, unit tests, but we found it to be very useful to actually to produce a higher quality code. And integration testing is actually a, a really interesting piece because, you know, some companies do uh, a lot of integration testing and some companies don't do as much. I think Tinder is at a place where we don't, we're not doing a whole lot of integration testing uh, for one because we haven't really found a lot of value in doing a lot of integration uh, testing uh, just yet. So we actually don't rely a lot on it before we get into uh, dog fooding. More, we rely more uh, just on the unit testing to kind of catch the small issues before it gets into the uh, b- before it gets into dog food. Are you making any inroads to getting to a continuous delivery process? We are uh, certainly, uh, you know, want to strive uh, for that. But uh, as you know, it's it's actually a very challenging to have uh, a, a continuous delivery for UI because for one, it actually changes quite often. So one thing that we didn't, the main reason why we didn't do a lot of integration testing is uh, because uh, especially on the UI is because our UI actually changes quite often, uh, especially kind of right before we ship there, there, there could be a lot of UI tweaking that happens. So there's there, there potentially could, there could be a lot of changes that on the UI uh, before that. So our integration testing would actually break quite a bit before the release. So, you know, that's why it, it gets very expensive to, to maintain that, that test suite as well. Understood. What's your interaction with Alex and the growth team? Yeah, so our team actually run uh, fairly independently. So I I mentioned earlier that our our engineers, they kind of interact with each other on a platform level, but that's more on an individual level. Just from a team perspective, we do have some key metrics that we have to make sure that are not affected before some of the growth features can actually, uh, you know, be rolled out. One example is that I remember Alex's team was working on something like he had a KPI that he was trying to improve, which was uh, was to improve the uh, click through rate of a profile. He was testing on a feature that super swiping up of a profile card uh, is opening up the profile. That was conflicting w- with the super like features that we had, right? Which is like super like is one of the a la carte purchase features that we had at Tinder, which is, you know, a big part of the revenue. So when when he was experimenting with the, the swipe up to open up the profile, we actually saw it, the uh, Tinder plus, uh, sorry, the Tinder uh, super like uh, purchase uh, metrics go down. So we realized that, oh, there's actually, there's a negative impact on, on the uh, the super like purchasing. So that was actually, uh, um, uh, there, there was an implication on revenue metrics. So you know, then that feature had to be rolled back. So the, the major interaction is really, you know, uh, the growth team, when they introduce their features, they have to kind of make sure that it doesn't impact some of the key metrics that we have on the revenue team. Hmm. What about the feedback loop between the customers and the, the users of the app and engineering? How do you detect that something is going wrong and work, that er- work those errors into the engineering process? 
Oh, so one of the, the kind of the, the best way for us to do it right now, or the, the one way that we rely on a lot is actually talking to our uh, customers directly. Most of our engineers um, have a test account. Some even have a real account of Tinder account when they actually test the app. So we match uh, and chat with a lot of uh, our users. Most of the time, we actually put uh, Tinder on our profile and we get a lot of messages from our users. They are really interested in, in you know, uh, in learning more about Tinder. And, and sometimes they would just kind of send us bucks or send us uh, suggestions. Like we don't even have to ask for uh, suggestions. And they, they just kind of come in when we, when we uh, test on Tinder. We have found that to be a very, very good way of getting feedbacks from the users. I, and I would say that we've been able to find uh, bugs and, and we've been able to, uh, you know, have a lot of good suggestions coming from, from that front. I want to wind down our conversation by talking about management. What's the biggest lesson that you've learned about managing people from working at Tinder? The biggest lessons I've learned about managing people. So when I joined Tinder, we were at about 50 engineers. Uh, That was only a short year ago. And uh, we have grown a lot since then. I think we're at about 120 people. So we've more than doubled the size. So when we were growing at a very fast pace, we also have to pay really close attention to the cultural shift uh, that's happening. We wanted to kind of maintain uh, still the kind of startup culture that we had and, you know, moving towards a a bigger team. So there's a lot of things that we have to kind of keep monitoring and and make sure that as the team grow, some of the growing pains uh, wouldn't be so apparent. Uh, for example, as the team got bigger, communication got a little bit harder across different teams. So we just kind of had to m- make sure we keep tabs on on, uh, on different uh, teams and make sure that, you know, that we are all uh, communicating between uh, uh, all the teams when we are growing. What's a mistake that you've made while manager, managing engineers? I remember when I first got started as a manager, um, I, I was uh, previously uh, an engineer myself. So when I first became a manager, I wanted to still be very, very involved, uh, you know, with the implementation process or, you know, the design decision process. And I would always, you know, try to provide feedbacks and I would try to really provide guidance on like how we should design a particular feature. And that turned out to be something that some of my engineers didn't really like very much because they, you know, they wanted to be able to kind of experiment and they wanted to kind of have to be, to be able to hands off so that they can actually have more control over the design themselves. So that's definitely one of the mistakes I made was just really trying, always trying to be too involved in, in the beginning. Have you learned anything about human psychology? So, for example, motivating people or choosing the words correctly to give feedback or noticing people's incentives or maybe somebody left the company and you were like, well, I I had no idea that person wanted to leave. I had no idea that person was not having a good time. Uh, If only I would have done X or set an expectation differently, that would have been a better outcome. Has it taught you more empathy? I mean, when I I interview people about management, they often say things like that, like empathy or better communication. Oh, yeah, sure. So I I found managing uh, people uh, sort of like kind of very similar to kind of just you know the 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 basic uh if you look at that uh, triangle where like the basic human needs when at the very bottom is kind of you know your your basic human needs is uh, hunger and you know finding a place and then you're moving on up you know to just trying to be more satisfied is being able to have a job and and then material uh just basically materials that you get right and then moving on up is you know actualization and and uh, prestige and that kind of thing it's very similar with management where you know you start at the bottom is basically you want to motivate people by kind of providing you know praises and and just uh, uh as well as just you know uh, uh, praise and punishment right like that's kind of sort of the the the, the very basic uh, management like that's how you kind of get people to like the, on a superficial level and as a manager, are you talking to to, to the man, to the employees, to the engineers, as if they're on a four year? Because I think in Silicon Valley, or well, in, in engineering everywhere, you know, you often get options, stock options on a four year vesting schedule. But most people, I think, stay at a company for twelve to eighteen months. So I find that sometimes the engineering management will will set 
you know, talk to the the underlings and be like, hey, what what are your four year goals? What do you want to accomplish while you're at the company? When actually they should be talking about twelve month time horizons or eighteen month time horizons. Uh, is is that at all of an issue when you're when you're trying to help the engineers grow in the way that they want to, and you have to figure out the right time horizon for that growth? Um, yeah. So I always kind of focus on on you know their personal growth, right? So, uh, for example, you have to really have to figure out what motivates uh, the, you know, the team members. And to, to some people, it, it, you know, it could be uh, monetary. It could be, you know, wanting to do you know, more things, getting, uh, get, getting more scope. Uh, for, but for different people, it could actually be uh, technical challenges, right? So, you, you know, the main thing is trying to figure out what areas they want to grow in and uh, kind of focus on that and, and, and try to expose more opportunities for them to so that they can grow in that specific area. All right, so last question. What would you personally like to do to grow within Tinder? Like, what are your personal goals for personal growth, and and how, how do you see Tinder itself growing uh, in the next, let's say, five years? How I see Tinder uh, growing in five years, you know, I, I, I do see Tinder kind of start branching out towards more on and just, you know, like instead of connecting people more for dating uh, purposes, uh, I see Tinder, you know, kind of start being more of a platform just to connect people in general, uh, connect people with similar interests, uh, connect people with similar goals. That's kind of how I see Tinder growing in, in about five years. In particular for myself, I, I still want to you know, remain uh, very technical and try to help uh, scale out Tinder um, uh, as we are actually getting more users. So I will still try to stay, you know, more on the implementation level and more on the back end and help Tinder grow uh, our, our back end services to kind of to, to satisfy our, our growing uh, user base. All right, Brian. Well, it's been great talking to you. It's really interesting conversation. I found Tinder to be a fascinating app and I've used it before and I think it's fantastic. Uh, how it connects people and the interface and re- incredibly high uh, quality also just in terms of the reliability of the app and so so great work and keep up the great work great thank you thank you for having me if you are building a product for software engineers or devops engineers consider advertising on software engineering daily There are 24,000 engineers that listen to Software Engineering Daily on a daily basis. And if you've got a product or a service that you would like to get into the ears of those developers, we'd love to have you as a sponsor. You can send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com, and I'd be happy to tell you more about our sponsorship options and some of the success stories. We've got many repeat sponsors like Hired.com, Datadog, MongoDB, Amazon Web Services. These are big companies that know how to market to developers, and they have their advertisements run on Software Engineering Daily. So send me an email, jeff at softwareengineeringdaily.com, or if you work at a company that you think should sponsor Software Engineering Daily, tell your manager uh, and have them send me an email. Thanks again to listening to the show and all the listeners who support the show by checking out the advertisements. Uh, You are much appreciated. Now let's get on with this episode. Wow.